Welcome back, everyone. I am Cass Pianci, and I am joined, as usual, by my partner in crime, Mr. Bennett Tomlin. It has been a very eventful day in cryptocurrency. Uh, today is Monday, May 9th. So there's a lot going on outside of El Salvador, but actually there's some going on in regard to El Salvador, Mr. Bukele, and Chivo, which is what we're here to discuss today with my partner in crime, Bennett Tomlin. How are you? Well, uh, doing well, if a little frenetic, trying to track the death of Tara, but excited to be here. Yes, and then we are joined by an extra special guest, Domingo, who is a InfoSec and privacy specialist and is quite familiar with uh, Chivo Wallet and what's been going on with uh, BTC implementation in El Salvador. So it's a pleasure to have you on, Domingo. How are you? Well, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm doing fine. Thank you. Like you said, it's been a, quite a, a hectic day. It's, uh, it's crazy out there in the internet, <laughs> in the blockchain <laughs> world especially. In the metaverse. Yes, your, your, your episode on, on Terra was so well-timed, it's almost prophetic. <laughs> I don't think we can take credit for the effects, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, it was uh, pretty intense. But let's move past that. Um, let's, let's get started here. This is an easy discussion to start on. Um, today, Mr. Bukele announced that he had bought the dip on Bitcoin, um, that he had purchased, I believe, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, I believe it was 500 Bitcoin is what he claimed. That is right. Now, there's been some pushback from some of the Salvadorans that I talked to on cryptocurrency Twitter and some of our previous guests, and they suggest that he didn't announce the wallet that this purchase occurred with and that that points to maybe... He did not, in fact, buy the dip. Uh, Domingo, do you have any thoughts on all of this? Yes, well, very much the consensus of everyone that follows these developments is that they're lying. They said they were going to buy the dip when it was a little over 40, a little under 40, then back in 40. So they've been constantly buying the dip, but there's absolutely nothing that tells us if this is true or not. They haven't made the addresses public. They haven't made anything really public. What little we know is due to leaks and, uh, well, the very recent legal action that Athena took in, back in the United States. Those are our sources of information. So when they say we're buying the dip, it's like, really? Because if what he says is true, well, uh, somebody uh, on Twitter by the name that goes by the name of Uriel earlier today released a chart in Excel, simple chart, you know, tracking how much he has bought, how much they stand to lose as of today. And it's really not looking great at all. They were standing to lose about 30%. So it's terrible. But that's the reality that we really don't know if, if they are really doing that. And what makes us suspicious that this isn't happening is that this happens consistently every time Bitcoin is dropping. Bukele tweets, oh yeah, we bought the dip. Hmm, is it a coincidence that they do it every single time? And, you know, we grow very suspicious because uh, let's just say that Bukele has a history of lying to our faces. <laughs> well, and even if he's telling the truth and is doing it every time, there's still a lot of open questions, as I understand it, around what that process looks like. And some have even suggested that it's just Bukele doing it on his phone while he's taking, uh, while he's using the toilet. And so even if he's telling the truth, there's still some potentially other uh, troubling aspects of how El Salvador has gone about acquiring Bitcoin on these dips. Indeed, and the source of that uh, rumor that Bukele buys Bitcoin naked is himself. He tweeted that. <laughs> so yeah, it's not really a reliable source of information either. I could believe that he uh, governs the country naked. I have a harder time to believe that he has bought those Bitcoins that he says he bought. And let me tell you a little bit about the Bitcoin law and, and why I say he is being uh, consistently lying to our faces. So very first problems with uh, Chivo when the Bitcoin law was approved, they set aside, I, I think it was around 200 million for the Bitcoin implementation. At the time, they said they were going to give $30 to absolutely every single person that qualified to download the app and so doing a little math that doesn't really add up does it is that reserve really going to hold up not just for the 30 dollars bonuses for about um, close to four million people or four to five to six million people i can't remember 
because they also took into account uh, Salvadorans that are outside of the U.S. So does that hold up? Do they have enough Bitcoin to give to all of those people? They never really disclosed any of that. They, so they gave, they gave it to El, El Salvadorans abroad as well? I didn't know that. They did. So on launch day, a group of colleagues and I tested the app and some of them were abroad, you know. So I was testing with someone who was abroad because I did not have an iPhone at the time to test. Uh, and when they released it, it was, uh, you know, mass chaos. It did not work. So they uh, pulled it back from the app stores and released it just for iPhones. Not many Salvadorans have iPhones because they are unusually expensive in El Salvador. So a friend of mine who, a colleague who was living abroad, I told me, hey, can you download this thing with my uh, national ID number and see if it works for you? And it worked for him. That was my first experience with Chivo on launch day. And what happened was really terrible. It had the this KYC method where you could, you know, take your picture, take a picture of your national ID number. And the login was basically your national ID number, which is not at all private. Like in the US, you're, you're talking about your social, social security number. This is not the same in El Salvador. You give your national ID when you go to the gas station and buy gas with your credit card, when you go to the grocery store. So it's everyone knows everyone's national ID. And on top of that, the previous year, the uh, finances ministry had a leak in their website that exposed every single Salvadoran's national ID number, along with all the information that's on it. So there you have a wealth of information to do KYC fraud. And I wanted to test that. So I told me, can you just log that? And he says, oh, okay. And then time came to take a picture of the national ID. And he's like, can you send me your national ID? And I'm like, no, dude, I would rather not. But let's just do a quick test and try to scan the one on Wikipedia. So he did, and it worked. If you, if you look up in Spanish Wikipedia, there's a, a national ID for El Salvador there with a censored face and, and data, and it works. So it's like, wait, so this is not really doing any kind of image recognition. Okay, for the selfie, try just a random picture of whatever. And he did took a random picture of the very first thing he encountered, which was a coffee cup, and it worked. This was on launch day. So it's like everything we were fearing up to that point came to reality, but worse. Because if you think about it, there is a lot of money to be made by stealing those $30 of bonus. This leads me to a question right now that seems like exactly what you're going to lead into. But basically, I, I'm wondering if this is like an Occam's razor situation. Like if you're talking about sheer incompetence or if you're talking about purposeful negligence. And lens razor. That's an interesting uh, an interesting thought. And to be honest, I am not sure if what percentage was incompetence and what percentage was a malicious intention. And uh, this rabbit hole goes a little bit deeper than I was expecting to talk about in here, but uh, I will go down that <laughs> rabbit hole. So uh, let's just say I worked for a company that was uh, in close relations with Ulter. Ulter is the Venezuelan company that was in charge of coordinating development and implementation for the Chivo wallet, among other things. And so I have worked in freelance before with a crypto project once back in 2017. It was an experience so bad that made me go from, oh, I don't really care about this Bitcoin thing to I'm going to advocate so that people stop this fraud because it's just a scam. <laughs> That's... That's how bad it was. And it made me uh, feel bad in my conscience. So I was like, okay, I gotta do something to help the world heal from the damage I've done by doing sysadmin work for this asshole scammers. <laughs> so uh, I was kind of familiar. I was working at that company at the time as an infosec manager. And uh, my team was working directly with the older guys. And I have to say, <laughs> That the experience of working with Ulter and working in a startup crypto from some scammers around the globe is exactly the same. You, you've heard the bad stories, right? Uh, changes right at the 11th hour and things don't work and they tell you, oh, we're going to use this technology that absolutely the best. It was the exact opposite. It was absolutely the worst. And I'm talking specifically about, about the KYC. So you see where this is going. Eventually, uh, we were about to, you know, snap. And as the launch day uh, got closer, we gave them a lot of feedback about, look, you can't really 
have this weak KYC process. You have to do something stronger. You have to have people submit, you know, uh, some more documentation proving they are who they claim they are. Otherwise, you're going to have fraud galore. And we had fraud galore. We told them, look, you can't really have uh, a back office system. By the way, they uh, back in, I think it was in December or so, they changed it. So this isn't really working anymore. Just so people don't go be curious about it. But Chivo's back office at the time was open to the internet. It had no multi-factor authentication and no logs to check anything, basically. So we told them, look, you can't really do that and expect people not to have, um, you know, that it's very much the complete triangle of fraud. You know, the motivations are $30. The justification is that once they transfer those, some of those many $30, out of Chivo, it's going to be irreversible because it's a blockchain transaction and uh, you're giving them the opportunity to do it by having a weak KYC system and weak back office system and a lot of other things. Before you move on, when you say back office system, what was included in that at this point? So I never really got the opportunity to look at it with much in depth, uh, but my teammates who uh, I won't name and I don't really want to give any detail on it because they had uh, signed a very draconian NDA. So they got to look at it and they assured me it was bad in the sense that any operator within Chivo could do whatever they wanted. That sounds less than ideal. <laughs> in, in, indeed. So do you suspect that occurred? The fraud with uh, people stealing other people's identity and doing KYC fraud, this absolutely happened in a massive scale. As for the back office stuff, I like to think that it didn't happen because the company I work for did a really good job screening people, so they weren't really higher criminals. But uh, the reality is that there's just no way to know because they never shared any information about the back office, any logs, any reports, any data that could an we could analyze. This company had a really good policy that basically had us look into the operational processes of a company before we started operations. And from this analysis, we gave all of this information to Ulter before launch. And uh, then when it launched, well, we saw all of this came true. That, that's, I guess, the incompetence part. It was very much a startup, no, no planning, no... Uh, clear uh, lines and, and a lot of pushback from things that should have really, in hindsight, should have really been common sense, you know, like, for instance, in, in uh, business process outsourcing, generally, when you're dealing with a client that has your agents take confidential information, and I do consider managing a cryptocurrency wallet is a lot of confidential information, you generally don't want them to have uh, the internet at the tip of your hands, like, you don't, want, you don't want people posting credit card numbers in YouTube comments or sending them direct messages on Facebook, on Twitter. But they push back even those kinds of things because of ridiculous stuff like, no, no, we want them to be able to look at the president's Twitter feed. So that's the part of the incompetence and, and negligence. As for the part of where this really was intentional and it gets a bit darker and a bit of a rabbit hole is a little bit outside of all that in the days after the implementation of Chivo, you know, fraud went rampant and people started, well, people that tried to sign up started discovering, oh, well, look, um, somebody already signed up with my national ID. What am I going to do? They stole my $30. And so we saw a lot of that, really a lot. And Bukele started making claims about absurdly high numbers of registered users. Are they true? We can't really know because they never released anything. However, if we take his word and assume that the four to five million users that Chivo has or that he claims it has are real. There's a lot of gang members from, you know, MS and 18th Street gangs that essentially an easy, an easy way to systematically uh, steal those 30 bucks. And um, you get to wonder, wh why didn't they start investigating all these over a thousand documented cases of fraud in Chivo wallet by the end of the of last year? And that's what it gets ugly. It's when you realize that the government has been making packs with the gangs for a very long time, for as early as, well, as early as 2016 or something that the uh, previous government started doing packs with the gangs. But Bukele doubled down on that in making packs on one hand and on the other hand saying, oh, we go real hardcore against these guys. But in reality, you know, he was pampering them. So 
So you're suggesting that one thing that might be contributing to how slow they've been to respond to that stuff is because Bukele benefits from keeping those gangs and gang members happy. And so them taking $30 from a bunch of Salvadorans is not their top priority because it keeps these gangs he's making these packs with somewhat satisfied. I'm sad to say it, but yes. And I'm not saying that this is the only way that they keep them satisfied or the only way that they give them benefits, but it certainly is a way because, well, it's not really something that you would know if you don't have a lot of context in El Salvador. But the reality is that the gangs control a lot of the territory and uh, there's a whole there's whole neighborhoods where you can't go in if you don't live there. You can't receive visitors from the from another neighborhood because the gangs control it and they think, oh, this guy's a spy or this guy comes to do deals in our turf. So what the gangs do and have been doing since ever, since they existed, is they take your national ID in the past gotten mugged and robbed and threatened several times by gangs and they always take your national id number because your national id card has your address so they check oh so you are from san salvador um, from so and so neighborhood what are you doing here if you don't give them an answer to satisfy them you get beat up or killed or worse so they have been collecting id numbers for a lot of time and these id numbers don't change so if my if my id card gets stolen and i go get a new one it's going to be the same number with the same information on, unless i move so the the gangs even without taking into account the massive data leak already had a considerable number of id numbers to play with and with uh, absolutely no kyc for several weeks at a time they absolutely took advantage of that so right now El Salvador is currently under essentially martial law. Is that a correct representation of what's going on? Yes. So, and this also has to do with the gang packs. And I feel we're going a lot into that direction, but it's, I think it's essential to understand the context of the country, that it's very complex. Yes, the El Salvador is under what's essentially a martial law. Why did this happen? Well, it's well known that Bukele and his government had packs with the gangs. And even before Bukele, the gangs had this truce card where they would ramp up the murder rate in order to pressure the government to do things that benefit them. So, uh, you know, a bit of a month and a half ago, there was a very bloody weekend where over 84 people were killed in a single weekend. And uh, it was very random, like uh, people that were just, you know, going about their lives, not bothering anyone not having links to any gangs or anything get killed and get left in the open and so this was essentially well the government is never really going to acknowledge it but it's essentially a way for the gangs to pressure the government into doing some things and if you look at the context that was happening in around those days what was happening is that the government left free a couple of gang leaders that were wanted for extradition in uh, by the united states so what else did the, the gangs want? Did they want them to release a, another leader? Did they want them to get more uh, financial benefits? Who knows? But they tried to pressure the government like that. And the other thing that was happening around that time, or well, that started happening more pronounced in a more pronounced way around that time, is that the government is running out of money. So you would think that a government's most, uh, among their higher priorities, and because they have already a salaries law that dictates that they have to put that in the national budget, that they would pay their governmental employees on time, including the police, doctors, lawyers, everyone working in all three branches of government. Very much the only people that get paid on time over the last two months have been the army and people that are very high up directly under Bukele. So if the police isn't getting paid on time, did they have money to pay their uh, gang extortion money? Do you, you think the government is so broke that they can't afford to bribe MS-13 and 18th Street? It's a hypothesis, but given the context and the fact that they can't really pay even their policemen and their doctors and their lawyers, it's certainly uh, sounding like a really plausible hypothesis. What makes you think that the government has has no money? I mean, if he's buying every dip of Bitcoin, I, I, the suggestion would be that there's plenty of cash to go around, right? And, and to go along with that, if he can hand out $30 to each and every Salvadoran uh, over the age of 18, 
then that is also uh, it. It points to the idea that there's a significant amount of cash, right? Right, right. So, so about the uh, thirty dollar bonus, that's uh, that's an interesting point. So when it was announced, their intention was that the thirty dollars were not withdrawn from the ATMs, from the Bitcoin ATMs that these were going to be used in uh, businesses to, you know, uh, use as a legal tender currency. This didn't really happen. Uh, people, $30 is a significant amount of money for people making $300 a month, which is the majority of people in El Salvador. So people just really wanted the $30 and they weren't really going to be able to bear the fluctuations in Bitcoin's price. They absolutely can't. If, you know, just look at this week, if uh, a person making $300 and has all of their salary in Bitcoin, they're going to lose a lot. And they're living day to day, paycheck to paycheck. So mysteriously, the Bitcoin ATM started running out of cash, malfunctioning, and started getting a lot of restrictions on how much you can withdraw. Well, this was part by design and part incompetence because you couldn't withdraw money from the ATMs that wasn't in multiples of 10. So if you had $30, but Bitcoin price fell and now you have $29.95, you can only withdraw $20 and $9.90 stay in the wallet. Then also back to what I said earlier, the thing about it is, does those 200 millions really are enough to liquidate all that Bitcoin that's supposed to go around? In the legal papers uh, filed by Athena, we discovered that there weren't really dollars, they were dollar equivalent tokens. So again, as we were saying, and I think David Girard was saying too back in June, they just wanted to print money essentially. If you think about it, Bukele really is isolating himself with his dictatorial ways and his poor diplomatics. So right now he has no funding from the IMF. A uh, $1.3 billion deal fell off last year. They have bonds due for over a billion dollars later this year. And there's just no budget to pay that. Moody's, the, you know, the, uh, the risk uh, guys have us in the bottom tier, on the, on the rock bottom, because there's a very high risk that Del Salvador just cannot pay its, its debts. And not just that, but the Bitcoin scheme probably isn't working as Bukele intended because there's no mass adoption. Nobody uses that crap anymore. It's just enthusiasts, basically. And related to some of the um, monetary items that you're referencing, you talked about the deal with the IMF that ended up falling through, partially because of the Bitcoin law, if you believe what the IMF has to say. And then, of course, Bukele had proposed in partnership with Bitfinex, Blockstream, and Tether that they create their... Uh, Bitcoin bond, the Bitcoin volcano bond that was going to allow them to purchase even more Bitcoin and get some cash to pay down their debts. And then that fell through as well. And so they've lost the IMF funding, the Bitcoin bond they assumed would fill that gap. And so, yeah, I think it's quite plausible to me that they just don't have the cash going around, which brings us back to something you alluded to there. Uh, that David Gerard has mentioned, which is that Chiva was, some people believe, intended as like a Trojan horse to allow Bukele to create his own digital cologne and start printing money again using Chivo. And if I remember right, there was some reporting out of, I want to say El Faro, but I'm not 100% sure, that uh, had gotten some quotes or some documents from one of Bukele's brothers or something that seemed to allude to that part of the plan. Um... In your exposure to Chivo Wallet or any of the work on it, did you see any evidence that they were planning something like that? Well, uh, you're right. It was Alfaro that reported that. And unfortunately, there's really no way for me to confirm that. However, the uh, the whole Alfaro reporting is very accurate. And it may seem uh, a bit stretchy that they were trying to do that. But uh, Bukele's brothers are not appointed or elected officials. They're just his brothers. And uh, the whole Bitcoin thing was never a, a promise in their campaign. It was never something that they said they were going to do. And this is part of, a, I guess, a pattern from governments in the post-war where they are faced with a crisis and they just pull something out of nowhere that in their wildest beliefs think it's going to solve things and ends up crashing and making everything worse. 
First thing is uh, the dollarization of El Salvador. It came in about the year 2001, you remember? This was essentially the work of some really diehard fans of Margaret Thatcher and uh, their fantasies of uh, neoliberalism being the end-all uh, economic ideology and uh, they ran with it and uh, well it's debatable that the the effects of the dollarization in El Salvador were good or bad in the long term but in the short term it was devastating for the most economically vulnerable people in El Salvador which is the majority of people then uh, give or take 10 years and the uh, next government that was a very right-wing government the next government was uh, the FMLN that was uh, a very a former guerrillas, basically a, a very left-wing party. And uh, they were trying to deal with the gang problem, which is a problem that it has its origins in the war. People migrating, running away from literal war, dead squads and all, getting uh, stranded in the US where they don't speak the language, where they are very poor and marginalized, and kids have essentially nowhere to turn. No family, no school, no nothing. They become antisocial and violent criminals. What happens when the El Salvador signs the peace agreements? The US starts deporting them back and getting back to El Salvador, they start creating all sorts of problems because they have never really lived there. The only way of life they know is crime and they go back to society that rejects them. So they explode into this movement that starts uh, amassing all the other marginalized kids and that were a lot by, by the way. And uh, explodes in violence in the 90s were a very violent time the early 2000s were a very violent time the right-wing governments has tried to calm that down using force arming the police escalating the violence if you walk into a mcdonald's in el salvador 100 percent the chance that there's armed guards in there with automatic weapons that's how it is so the violence escalated and the fmln government seeing this crisis first tried the same thing you know ramping up the police and the army didn't work and then started doing talks underground with the gangs and that's when they started doing the packs. This eventually got uncovered again by El Faro and it blew in their faces, threw their popularity off and didn't really solve the thing because the governments, what they were trying to do was just lower the murder rate by uh, appeasing them with economic benefits and other things and the murder rate is not, I mean it is a good, indi it is an indicator of violence clearly but it's not the only indicator of violence and it's uh, not really a good thermometer for violence in El Salvador. And this may sound weird, but it, the situation is very complex. However, this government, Bukele, just ramped up what the two previous governments were doing, you know, ramping up the uh, police and giving more force to the army and making more pacts with the gangs. And then out of nowhere, comes this uh, solution for the economic crisis, the, you know, supposed solution to Bitcoins. So where did that come from? Bukele's brothers, Bukele's family. I have been looking really hard for this video, but I can't seem to find it. And I think it may be lost media, but uh, I'm trying to contact some journalists in El Salvador, see if we can uh, locate it. There's a video of Bukele in his 2015 campaign where he was saying that he was funding his campaign with Bitcoins which I find really interesting because that means he's been holding for a long time and is maybe wanting a way to cash out or to, you know, basically legalize his, his uh, or use the government in aiding him to cash out without crashing the price or some sort of thing like that. So we're, we're talking about a lot of things here, but I, something that I'm, I'm struggling to reconcile this idea that on one hand, Nayib Bukele and the El Salvadoran government are unable to afford to pay their employees on time. They're struggling month after month to do this. And yet this oversold volcano bond that would provide them all of this money to support these employees and support continuing governance has been delayed for whatever reasons. And I'm wondering why. I'm wondering why you would delay something that would give you an influx of cash if you're so desperately requiring this cash right now. I, I'd like genuinely wondering what, what the reasoning is if we're looking for a, not just, oh, it just is bullshit reason. Like what could make sense here? Help me understand. 
So I think it was Bloomberg or a journal to that effect that said that no one had bid on the Bitcoin bonds because they didn't really make sense in that if they're going to give you just 6% of yield, I guess. And so it's like, why not just buy Bitcoin if you believe it's going to reach a million dollars in price in, in, in five years? And also what they were basically doing, and this is rather interesting, the Bitcoin bonds, is instead of being uh, backed by the nation, uh, backed by the state, they were going to be uh, brought on from, from a company owned by the state, by La Geo, the geothermal power company in El Salvador that's owned by the government. So the La Geo doesn't really have the collateral to pay in case the bonds fail, in case the price doesn't rise as they expect or if it's uh, undersold or whatever. So this was a, a, a little uh, trick they did, very much the same as with Chibo, that's a private company owned by the uh, National Power Company. So that's uh, part of the reason why I think they're saying that they delayed it for, well, they listed a plethora of reasons, including the war in Ukraine, when in, in reality, I think they are just bullshitting. And the reality is that maybe nobody wanted to buy that because they were just trying to offload the risk on the retail market. They were going to sell the bonds to exchanges who were then going to sell them to average Joes. And there's just not enough liquidity. There's just not a big enough supply of greater fools to do that. And so nobody really wanted to carry on doing that. Right now, even the crypto market is as volatile as it usually is. So I think it's bullshit. I think they didn't really get anyone to buy the bonds. And that's why they uh, cited random reasons to cancel them or postpone them. And now that Bitcoin is crashing, they can easily say, oh, uh, yes, see, we were wise to can to postpone the bonds because the Bitcoin price is falling. We predicted that, seriously. <laughs> so I don't think that's uh, that's how it works. Well, and it's especially embarrassing because several prominent members of the cryptocurrency community came out and assured everyone that that bond was oversubscribed with more interest than the bond could even match and that it was basically uh, going to be no issue at all. And so then to have that fall through means that El Salvador wasn't the only one lying and Bukele wasn't the only one lying during the marketing of this bond. It was also everyone else involved, like Max Kaiser, who got in front of the world and said, oh, no, there's plenty of interest here. This won't be a problem. We're already oversubscribed. So a whole bunch of people there with uh, some egg on their face. Indeed. And uh, of course, Max Kaiser's source is always trust me, bro. <laughs> but uh, like, Max Kaiser, it, it's not the very first time he's lied to our faces. I mean, like his Costa Rica house. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, he said in a tweet, look, I just bought this mansion in El Salvador with Bitcoins and it turned out to be in Costa Rica and it turned out to still be for sale. So, yeah, they, they do that. <laughs> they have to they have to ramp up the Ponzi scheme somehow. They have to build trust in, in that the pyramid won't fall apart. I don't know if either of you noticed, but they unveiled a uh, Bitcoin city today. Again? How many times do you get to unveil something? Yeah, they did a, a giant, a giant like 3D uh, one to whatever scale version <laughs> of the Bitcoin city in all gold colored. Uh, yeah, I, I thought the news story that they were sticking to now was that the first bond was going to be for building out the geothermal and that the Bitcoin city was like an aspirational goal. Are they back to pretending the Bitcoin city is a real thing that's going to happen? Naive is looking cool as ever looking at the Bitcoin city. So, yeah, let me let me give you some context on that, because Bitcoin city and all of the other uh, real estate projects related to crypto that have spurred in El Salvador are just another level of bullshit that I have not seen before. And Bitcoin City is located in uh, the Union Department on the far east of El Salvador. This place is just never getting built. If it gets built, it will be a tragedy for humanity. But I don't think it's going to get built. If you look at the model that they unveiled today, it's a concrete plague, just buildings upon buildings. This absolutely cannot fly in La Union. All year round, it's around up from 35 degrees Celsius, which is close to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, all year round. Eventually it rains. But this kind of construction just cannot exist there first. Second, there is not even a study that says that they can get geothermal energy from the Conchagua volcano. That's just a volcano. But you can't just pick any volcano and get geothermal energy from anyone you pick, let alone enough geothermal energy to power a city and Bitcoin mining. 
So this is just not realistically going to happen. If it does happen, they're going to have to power it, I don't know, from a giant coal plant that they're going to say it is geothermal and that the smoke is actually water vapor. It's just not happening. Oh, and I forgot to mention that this Bitcoin city is built on top of like hundreds of square miles of ecological protected territory. Well, like endangered species and, and all that. Not just that, there's a drought in that part of the country. So there's the neighboring towns to what would be Bitcoin City right now, without Bitcoin City, without a new geothermal plant, are lacking drinking water. So where are you going to get water from a big ass mega city one lookalike? It's just not happening. It's never going to happen. They, I, I, I think that they saw Bitcoin dropping and said, quick, let's put something to remind people that there's hope that Bitcoin City will be a thing. I thought that that location that they picked out where they intended to build this Bitcoin City, so he's drop in the shape of a Bitcoin now, was originally part of a negotiation between the El Salvador government and the Chinese government for them to build a bunch of facilities in that location. But it seems like from what you're saying that even for them to have done that would have taken a pretty massive amount of build off to pull off. Yes, essentially, uh, the previous government, the FMLN, had a, well, you know, they were very aligned with China and, and, and to some extent Russia and Venezuela. So they went and did a lot of diplomatic work with China to get some goodies from them, including uh, what they would call an economic free zone or something like that. I, the, the word is ex escaped me, but it was essentially a privatized land where they would build, uh, you know, infrastructure for Chinese business. So uh, the previous government uh, put that on, on the table. And funnily enough, at the time, Nayib Bukele said, oh, this is the most right wing thing that the leftist government is ever going to do. Privatize land to give to a foreign power. Crazy. So uh, eventually he comes around and gets this, this very same plan and starts building imaginary castles and mega Bitcoin cities on top of it. So I'm wondering, like, at this point, after having seen all of this, Outside the scope of these hypotheticals and these Willy Wonka type ideas for the future of El Salvador, what do you still feel concerned enough to be joining us and talking to us about this? Well, uh, at the time that the Bitcoin law came in place, I was, uh, you know, vocally skeptic about it on Reddit and Twitter. Eventually, uh, I was involved in the Chivo project because the company I was working for got involved. So I went private on my accounts because it was directly conflicting with my opinions, right? So I kept quiet. And uh, then as things starting to roll out and get worse, my parents actually convinced me of deleting a lot of the tweets I posted around that era because they lived the, you know, the period preceding to the war in the 70s and the 80s where you could get literally killed for having an opinion and giving it to the public. So that kind of gave me a chip in my conscience. Then Mario got arrested and uh, it's like, oh damn, they're winning, I thought. Now I'm in, a, in a, a bit of a more free position to talk because I'm not compromising my income, you know, my employment. However, I, I think we are very close to the point of no return where El Salvador will be ruined for generations to come if we just let these guys uh, have their way. In what sense? Well, economically, it's already very close to ruin if the government can't pay policemen on time and teachers on time. But also environmentally, it's Bitcoin is just a disaster, environmentally speaking. They are currently mining Bitcoin and using geothermal power. That's just a terrible idea. Not just it doesn't really even make economic sense because electricity and geothermal electricity production in El Salvador is more expensive. It's, it's expensive enough to not give them any uh, profit, so they're just doing it to save face, but saving face is costing us a lot. And uh, specifically, I mean, the geothermal plant where they are mining Bitcoin. And the, when they started mining Bitcoin, all of the communities around it in like a 10 to 20 kilometer radius immediately started having water supply problems. And uh, water supply problems mean different things in El Salvador than in the developed world. In my house, I have, uh, I had, uh, and my family has, uh, quote unquote, steady water supply. And this means they get up to eight hours a day of water. For example, from like 
8 a.m. to 4 p.m., you open the faucet and there's water, not drinking water, water. And in this impoverished communities real, uh, around the geothermal plant, not having access to water is they don't have access to water at all for months at a time. And uh, this situation is just getting out of hand. El Salvador is the second most, is, is the country with the second most deforestation. We are almost in the single digits of percentage of uh, natural forests. From a place that was very uh, lively and home to a lot of endangered species, that's just tragic. And what are we leaving to our children then? Are we going to ruin it in a five or ten year period, which is what this government is they're very much speed running the ruin of the country and the people living in it. So this, of course, concerns me. And aside from the environmental aspect of it, Bukele and his, and, and his cronies are essentially demonstrating that Bitcoin is or are using Bitcoin as the exact opposite of a tool for freedom in a country that already had very restricted freedoms. They are taking them quite literally with the uh, uh, regime of exception, the martial law. And the thing is that the more they uh, stay in government, the more they are going to start taking freedoms from us, from the citizens, because they will otherwise not be able to remain in power. So, yeah, that's that's really my motivation. Uh, just to give you an idea, because uh, I feel a lot of people don't really have context on how bad the martial law is right now. They have suspended the right to defend yourself legally if you are apprehended. They have suspended the uh, privacy of communications, which means they can, without a warrant, arrest you and deny you your right to legal defense and put you in jail. And so from the time the martial law started about a month and a half ago, now it's been now around 26,000 people imprisoned. How many of those people are innocent and were just in the wrong place and the wrong time or were just captured to fill the quota, right? So I, I feel I have an obligation to protest that and, you know, that's that's very much it. Yeah, that's a, that's a really scary combination of circumstances you're talking about there. Like a energy and water insecure nation with an authoritarian government cut off from international funding with a massive organized crime problem that recently imposed martial law and arrested thousands of people is historically is a really bad combination of circumstances that leads to bad things for a lot of people who live in the countries and that's that's a really scary possibility well it's not the most optimistic but um perhaps a poignant point to end on <laughs>